Welcome to the New Jersey Astronomical Association and our fourth Saturday series of educational talks. We're privileged to have as our speaker this evening, Dr. Michael Strauss. Dr. Strauss hails from Princeton University and is chair of the Department of Astrophysical Sciences. Tonight, he will be discussing his work on extragalactic astronomy and observational cosmology. Michael Strauss is interested in all aspects of extragalactic astronomy and observational cosmology, especially in the context of wide field imaging and spectroscopic surveys of the sky. He has used large surveys, including IRAS, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, to study the large-scale distribution of galaxies to constrain cosmological parameters, the relationship between galaxy properties and their environment, and the nature and evolution of active galactic, active galactic nucleus, AGN, and quasars at large redshift. He's now using data from the Hyper Suprime, which is a Subaru Prime focus camera on the Subaru telescope to search for distant quasars and study the properties of galaxies in which they live. He's involved in planning the next generation of large surveys, including the prime focus spectrograph on Subaru and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Please be advised that we will be monitoring the YouTube chat box for your questions this evening, and he will be taking questions during the talk, so please uh, feel free. All right, Dr. Strauss, we are ready to go. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, so uh, thank you and thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'm really, of course, uh, delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you. Disappointed that we can't be together at the observatory itself uh, so we could see each other face to face. Uh, but uh, this is a good opportunity um, uh, for me to tell you about uh, some of the exciting uh, new developments in, in our field and try to understand what uh, mapping the universe is really all about and, and, and how that's important in our modern uh, exploration uh, of the universe. Uh, as, as indicated, um, I'm happy to take questions throughout. Um, just put them in the chat box and, uh, and um, I'll, I'll answer them um, at, um, at, at appropriate times throughout. And of course, um, and we can have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you know, our goal here is to uh, ask ourselves, what does it mean to map the universe and, not, and really answer this question where we fit in uh, uh, on Earth uh, in the cosmos overall. So uh, so let's get started. Uh, we all know what a map is. Here's a map of the area around Princeton. Um, uh, not too far, you sort of all, all know what we're looking at. It's a, it's an, it's a, a graphic that shows uh, what our immediate environments are. And of course, as astronomers, we find ourselves uh, looking at maps on a variety of scales. We might step back a little bit and look at uh, the entire uh, northeastern uh, uh, seaboard, um, the east coast of the United States. And again, uh, familiar and we, we know where, where we are. Whoops. And, uh, and stepping back further, we see uh, the entire Earth. This, of course, is not a not a map in the in in the graphical sense as before, but the an actual an actual uh, photograph taken uh, from a satellite. So um, I think we all have some sense of how large the Earth is. I mean, we've stepped out. You can still see New Jersey in the upper right of 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 uh, this this picture, and uh, you know we know that the Earth has a um, the number that I keep in, in mind is a radius of 6,400 kilometers. Uh, that's a diameter, I'm sorry, a radius of about 4,000 miles. Uh, we, we have some sense of that because this is the Earth on which we live and we can imagine getting on planes and going from one part of the Earth to, to another. Um, but let's put that, that sense of how large the Earth is and remind ourselves that the Earth, of course, is going around the sun. Um, here's a schematic of the solar system. Uh, one of those inner circles there represents the orbit of the Earth. And the distance from the Earth to the sun, which is often called one astronomical unit, it's a, one of the terms that astronomers like to use, is ten, about 10,000 times larger than the diameter of the Earth itself. You have a sense of how large the Earth itself is, multiply that by 10,000 and that gets you to the sun. And that represents a distance uh, that sort of sets the scale 
of the solar system of the again the earth going around the sun we often refer to the the size of the orbits of the other planets in terms of astronomical units in terms of uh, distance from earth to the sun but we're gonna we want to go about out quite a bit further than that um, we look at at the night sky this particular picture is um, taken uh, from the southern hemisphere you can see Sagittarius uh, rising there uh, in the east, and uh, you can tell this is the southern hemisphere because the large and small Magellanic clouds are visible in the lower right, um, which are uh, cannot be seen, uh, unfortunately, from here uh, in New Jersey. But one has to travel um, close to or south of the equator to to see that. Um, so what we're looking at, of course, is is a is a sky filled with stars. Uh, the nearest star, of course, are, is our own sun, one astronomical unit away. Uh, ten, again, 10,000 times the diameter of the sun, uh, diameter of the earth, excuse me. But, but uh, if we talk about the other stars, um, let's remind ourselves just how far away those are. So the nearest star other than the sun, uh, Proxima Centauri, is about 40 trillion kilometers away. And I wrote out all the zeros there, you can count them. Uh, it's four followed by 13 zeros. And that number is about 30 million times the sun's diameter. The sun is about 100 times uh, the diameter of the Earth, and then multiply that by 30 million, and you get to the nearest stars. One of the reasons I'd like to emphasize this number of 30 million is it reminds us just how empty um, the space between the stars are. Uh, the sun is enormous by human standards, of course, but you have to go th 30 million times its size to get to the nearest star, and that's sort of a typical distance between stars. And to get a, a sense of just how large this number of 40 trillion kilometers is, you put Jeff Gordon in the 24 car uh, NASCAR, and should there be a road, and he goes at 30, 300 kilometers an hour, which is sort of NASCAR speeds, it would take him about 16 million years to drive that far. And I didn't even take into account the uh, pit stops that he's going to need to go along the way. I don't think he'll quite do it on a single tank of gas. So um, that gives you some sense of, of the distance to the near, nearest stars. And the numbers get so big so quickly that we find ourselves um, switching the way that we talk about distances. Um, we know that light travels in about uh, 300,000 kilometers uh, per second. Uh, that is indeed the speed of light. And we, we find it convenient to often refer to large distances, which is really what astronomy is all about, in terms of the time uh, light takes to travel. So one light year is the distance that light travels in one year in, in about 30 million seconds. And that number turns out to be about 10 trillion kilometers. So the nearest star that uh, Proxima Centauri I re made reference to on the previous slide is about four light years away. And in that way, one astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, is about eight light minutes away. So those are some useful numbers uh, to, uh, to think about. But four light years is, is still very nearby uh, when you're talking to an astronomer. Um, we, uh, we, the Earth uh, is orbiting the Sun. The Sun is one of several hundred billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, which again, if we go back to this, there it is. This picture is one one view of it. Here's another uh, composite view, actually covering the full um, the full Milky Way, um, stitch, stitching together a variety of Im images. And the that Milky Way galaxy has a diameter that's about a hundred thousand light years across. We're not going to express it in kilometers or how long it takes Jeff Gordon to drive drive that fast, but rather we're going to um, we're, we're going to be speaking in, in light years uh, going forward, 100,000 light years across, um, where the nearest star, again, is about five, four, light, four light years away. So, um, you know, so that's what we see when we look at the, at the night sky. We see stars sprinkled out at a variety of distances, um, which are part of um, the Milky Way galaxy stretching across the sky. But it's worth remembering that there's more to the sky uh, than just the stars in the Milky Way. So here's a picture uh, actually taken from, um, with a telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which um, is, is one project that I've been involved in. Um, this is a relatively small uh, patch of sky in the constellation Perseus. Um, all, those, 
um, all the dots that you see are stars uh, within our own Milky Way and may have distances that are perhaps measured in thousands of light years, maybe a typical number. But the big fuzzy yellow patches are not stars, they are galaxies um, that we now know are distances of, of tens of millions of light years. Um, and we'll, we'll in just a moment, uh, tell us, uh, say a few words to, um, about um, how, we, how we have measured those distances and how, and how we know they're uh, that far apart away. So um, it's worth looking at this picture and remembering that um, when we look at a picture of the sky through a telescope, um, a small telescope, a large telescope, just uh, with our naked eye, just uh, looking at it uh, from our backyards, um, what we see uh, appears two-dimensional. It looks like we can make a, a two-dimensional picture. And from, a, from the picture alone, we have no depth perception. We don't have a sense of what's nearby or what's far away. I've told you that the, that the things that look like stars, the point-like objects here are, you know, perhaps a few thousand light years away, each, each their own specific distance. And the big fuzzy yellow things are galaxies at a much larger distance. But, but understanding uh, that how do we get that depth perception and understand um, what uh, what what the full three dimensional distribution of objects is 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 been one of the big and major themes of 20, 20th century and indeed twenty first century astronomy uh, and one of the great challenges because again at a, looking at a picture like this there is no de no depth perception so let's let's go explore that a little bit um, though um, astronomers saw in, in the sky a, a, a number of objects that they called at one point spiral nebulae, that was the term. And it one of the great um, triumphs in astronomy just, just about uh, 100 years ago was the realization that these spiral nebulae are structures as large as the Milky Way itself. It was about 100 years ago that people, um, uh, Harlow Shapley is one name that's associated with the great discovery of the full extent of, of, of the Milky Way and the understanding that the sun is, is um, not at the center, but sort of two-thirds of the way uh, out, from, out from the center. Um, but when he came up with this understanding that this entire structure was 100,000 light years across, his, his understanding was that's so enormously vast that must represent the entire universe. But it was discoveries uh, from a variety of people, including Edwin Hubble, about whom I'll have a few words to say in just a bit, uh, who, uh, who uh, caused us to realize that the Milky Way is actually only one of, uh, using a modern number, hundreds of billions of galaxies in the observable universe. And um, at, a, at an enormous range of different distances, much, much larger than the size of the Milky Way itself. And here's a picture of a, of a handful of relatively nearby uh, galaxies. So um, let's get a sense of the scales here. And I, I've, well, I've said the words, and I showed this picture back here. Um, you know, there's galaxies and stars. And the, uh, one of the things that one, one is used to looking at pictures like this, which represents a small patch of the sky. Um, I, I should have looked up the numbers here, but I think we're looking at a few arc minutes, a few, maybe a few tens of arc minutes across in an image like this. But the sky is a big place. And let's get a sense of that. And what we're going to do is just do a series of steps outwards of from data for, um, from the same telescope that took the pictures a, a little while ago from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And I'm just going to step out. And I imagine uh, for those of you who have looked at astronomical images before, we'll very quickly re recognize the picture that that, that uh, we're talking about here. Um, I imagine uh, some people, some some of the people in the audience will actually recognize this galaxy, the whirl what's called the Whirlpool Nebula. It's I think historically the first galaxy that was recognized to have spiral arms. As you can see, they're rather dramatic. In fact, this is two galaxies in the process process of uh, interacting with each other. And in that interaction, in fact, it's that interaction that uh, makes these spiral arms so, so dramatic. And if you look, or look in its vicinity, you see lots of stars as well, which are, of course are going to be much, much closer. And you'll, if you look carefully, uh, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor as I move around. You can see a background galaxy yes, here. Uh, here's another one. Here's another one. They're sort of sprinkled around. Uh, and uh, we can 
we can sort of admire the stars and galaxies here. Let's just continue stepping stepping out and seeing what happens. And all we're doing is zooming out from a sort of from a comprehensive map of the sky carried out by this telescope, uh, what's called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You can see more stars. Here's a up in the upper left here. Here's an, another galaxy that you'll recognize. Some galaxies down here. Some red stars. You know, one of the things which is worthy of a whole talk in itself is the stars uh, and the galaxies for that matter come in a variety of different colors about which there's lots of interesting things to say. Let's keep on zooming out. Oops, there's a big white blob here. What that is is a star that's so bright that if we just showed it by itself, you wouldn't really get it. Uh, it would just sort of overwhelm the image so it's been replaced with a white blob. We'll zoom out to keep on zooming out a little bit further. And you'll see a few more of those white blobs, which are particularly, these are basically naked eye stars at, at this point. At this point, we've zoomed out enough that the Whirlpool galaxy, is, which is right in the middle, is, is almost invisible. I mean, it's still there. It's the same image. Basically, all I'm doing is taking the same image and zooming out. But as we continue to go out, you may start recognize the pattern of, of, of blobs here. The stars. I, I imagine you will recognize the Big Dipper there, uh, and uh, I think, uh, or maybe we can see Arcturus if we continue uh, stretching out there. Uh, anyway, this what this final picture is is um, is sort of the full uh, map of the sky that was created by this uh, telescope called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey at the time. This little compos uh, composite of images was put together, and again, this. Um, when uh, one of my colleagues who, who made this montage that we've just uh, shown you first uh, shared this, he said, he showed this picture and, and said, uh, I've called this uh, the Whirlpool, a uh, picture of the Whirlpool Nebula and, and asked people to guess why that was. And of course, the answer is you had to zoom all the way back in to see that. So anyway, um, so let's, let's, again, this is a two-dimensional image. We're not getting to the third dimension. And, and it's the third dimension that I think if we really want to talk about mapping the universe, we're sort of mushing things that are nearby, uh, maybe even our own, own solar system, asteroids, and, and an occasional planet uh, at an intermediate distances uh, uh, within our own Milky Way, and then imagine unimaginably large distances, the galaxies. And we really have to tease out that third dimension to move forward. So let me um, let me show a different version of the map. It's, it's actually um, a modest subsection of that. Each dot here represents one of the galaxies. Basically, it's just taking the catalog of galaxies that came from that image uh, and just putting out a dot at each one. There's 400,000 galaxies in this picture. I'll let you count to check me on that. Uh, and again, this is a two-dimensional picture. How do, we map, how do we map this in three dimensions? So for that, we have to... Um, we have to introduce our friend Edwin Hubble, um, shown here um, looking at uh, one of the telescopes at uh, Palomar Observatory. And, and uh, his great, he made a number of absolutely fundamental discoveries in astronomy, but perhaps the most, the most fundamental was, was by measuring, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, the, motion, the motions and distances of galaxies. And he came to the conclusion uh, that the universe is expanding. Um, if, if we were live, I would quiz you all and ask you um, how you can tell that this particular picture is a setup and not a candid, a candid shot. Somebody has photoshopped in the, the star field on the right, but there's another reason which any amateur astronomer will immediately recognize is uh, tells you that this is a posed picture, which is that here, here he is observing through the eyepiece with the lights on in the dome. <laughs> not, 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 uh, not the way to do it. To do astronomy, so there's clearly a, a post picture. But it's it's I show this picture to my students, and only occasionally do they do they get that. Anyway, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we actually measure that third dimension, uh, and this is using modern data. Um, what we're what we're looking at here is um, the spectra of a series of different astronomical objects, and let's start um, let's start with the upper panel. So. What we're showing here are plots. The, ex, the axis on the x, the, um, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, is a is the wavelength of light emitted uh, by the star. And we're looking over basically the bluest light that your eye can see, which corresponds turns out to 4,000 angstroms. Angstroms are funny astronomer units. Um, 
to uh, about 7,000. So that corresponds to the bluest light that your eye is sensitive to. 7,000 angstroms over on the right corresponds to the reddest light that your eye is sensitive to. So these, these, pic, these spectra represent the full range that at least the human eyes is sensitive to. And the quantity on the y-axis is the amount of light that this, this particular star is emitting as a function of that wave length. And that's what we refer to as an astronomical spectrum. And when you look at it, um, you see that there's an overall shape, which there's a long and interesting story that that's related to the surface temperature of the star. Um, but you also see, see, see uh, some characteristic dips. And I'm going to concentrate. You can see my mouse here. Um, the dips over here on the left-hand side um, at about 4,000 angstroms. It turns out um, that that's due to uh, ionized calcium in the atmospheres, in the atmosphere of this star. And so astronomers use spectra like this to learn that um, that stars have, among other elements, calcium, and the various other dips can tell you about other elements and so on and so forth. And stellar astronomers have great fun um, learning about the properties of uh, um, stars that way. If you take a spectrum of a galaxy, one of those spiral nebulae, what you what you see is similar dips here. Here in this next galaxy, you see a dip here. Uh, you see it's really characteristic characteristic uh, shape, these two, two dips uh, adjacent to each other. And indeed, if you trace it out carefully, you'll see a similar pattern of dips sort of across all of these spectra. Um, my now late colleague, uh, John Hooker, uh, who spent much of his life uh, studying galaxies um, was particularly fond of these this pair of dips due to calcium. He called these the fangs. He nicknamed his computer the fangs. You can see why, because it it looks it looks like a like a slightly buck toothed vampire there. Um, so the first thing that you learn from this is galaxies are made of stars. That is, the, you see the the same kind of spectra shows up in the galaxies as they do as as in stars. And so you come to the correct conclusion that. Galaxies are made up of stars. The net, the uh, but the more the the next thing that you notice is that even though you see these fangs, these dips in the spectrum, uh, in each of these in each of these spectra, you see they're not showing up in the same place. And the interpretation of that is that this is because the galaxy is moving away from us. It is ultimately uh, a Doppler shift. Uh, one of the things. One of the um, something that's moving away from us, the light that's emitted has wavelengths that are shifted to longer wavelengths. This is what we call the redshift. And um, and um, so the first discovery is that essentially all galaxies that we measure have spectra that are redshifted. The galaxies appear to be moving away from us. And it was Hubble's great discovery, and we'll see. In fact, let me go to the next slide. The upper left is one of the first plots that he made. This is now an iconic figure, uh, where he each dot here represents one galaxy for which he has measured the redshift and therefore how fast it's moving away. And I label it here as velocity. And it would go beyond um, the time that we have here to explain how he determined the distance of each of the galaxies. You see that there's a rough uh, correlation. The more distant the galaxy is, the faster it appears to be moving from us, so the greater it is a redshift. Um, often, great discoveries are made. Uh, you're at the ble absolute bleeding ed edge of what technology uh, allowed one to do at the time, and so the data looked pretty crappy. Uh, but he came to the correct conclusion that there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. That that the larger the distance, the larger the larger the redshift. Um, that was 1936, I think, was this particular plot, this particular version of the plot. I think he first published this result in 1929. Um, a modern version of this is shown uh, in the lower, in this plot, in the lower right. Um, this is including work from the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is this particular plot is probably 15 years old. Again. Uh, the speed at which the galaxy seems to be moving away on the y-axis, the distance of each galaxy on the x-axis. There's technical differences here. This is actually a logarithmic plot, but for this purpose, it doesn't make much difference. Um, the area um, over which that original plot from Hubble came is really just the very lower left. Uh, and here, many more galaxies measured much, much more precisely uh, show that this one-to-one -one relationship between uh, velocity or red, equivalently redshift and distance really does does hold. So what this does is it, uh, it it starts giving us the story of the expanding universe. 
Uh, but for our present purposes, it gives us a way to do that map in the three dimensions. It says that in a sense, all we have to do is measure the spectrum of a galaxy, figure out how much it's redshifted, which crudely speaking can be uh, figured out by saying, where, where do the fangs actually sit? What is the wavelength of those fangs? And that is enough information to infer the distance. And in fact, I've tabulated the numbers here, did, did the arithmetic. The quantity Z is the fractional shift. It's the actual numerical quantity that astronomers call the redshift. Uh, and then this number here, is the, is the inferred distance of each, each of these uh, objects according to uh, the, what we now call the Hubble law. Uh, and you can see that the distances are measured in, for even the nearest one of the ones that I showed, distances of about a billion light years, three billion light years, four billion light years, five billion light years. You can see the numbers uh, get big very quickly. So uh, I think this is just what I said. Uh, if we can measure the redshift, we can estimate the distance. And so by measuring redshifts, we can map the distribution of the galaxies in three dimensions. We can finally uh, get away from that two-dimensional picture and see, and see what happens. So let's, let's see what it looks like. So um, here is a slice through a three-dimensional map of the distribution of galaxies. Again, each dot here represents a galaxy. There's about 10,000 of them in this, in this picture. Um, and um, and it's worth remembering that each of these dots represents a galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars. And when astronomers started making pictures like this, um, um, really this field started taking off, largely driven by the technology in the 1980s. This picture, this particular picture um, was sort of a, was, was the data for it was collected in the early 2000s. Astronomers were just blown away by the rich, the richness of the, the structure that we see. We see that galaxies um, often are formed along enormous, uh, what are sometimes called walls of galaxies. You can see uh, what we call the, this is what's measured from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and we refer to this enormous structure stretching across most of this picture as the Sloan Great Wall. Enormous regions almost completely empty of galaxies. And um, you know, the distribution of galaxies is, is really quite, quite interesting, more interesting than people have realized. And, and one of the directions we're going to be going in this talk is trying to understand where all that structure came from. So um, this is still a two-dimensional, it's no longer two-dimensional projection like what we saw before, but it's a two-dimensional slice through the full three-dimensional distribution. We can, we can do a little bit better than that. Oh, sorry, before we get there, I'm going to step back a little bit further and show um, the area of sky that we were looking at before is sort of on the left hand side of this figure um, stepping back a bit further and the full scale of this picture from one side to another is about six or seven billion light years across and again each dot here represents one galaxy <clears throat> and I, there's something like 50,000 dots in this picture and uh, just to answer an obvious question there the, the survey did not cover the entire sky so there's regions basically where the, our own Milky Way gets in the way uh, that are not surveyed, and that's the sort of empty regions at the top and the bottom. And we we are sitting at the center of this picture. We're the ones taking the pic pictures, so so uh, everything is sort of centered on us, um, just because we're we're the astronomers do doing the uh, uh, taking the picture. Okay, let's let's take another look at this. So this is another representation of it. Now we we'll get a, a better sense of full 3D distribution. So here, this is a computer rendering where the actual images of each galaxy are shown, and um, and we're we're flying. And of course, the positions are as as uh, comes through in in the um, from the redshift, and we're just flying around and, and getting a sense of the the richness of the of the distribution. Uh, that we have here. You can see galaxies whiffing by. I, I believe the galaxies were made a little bit bigger than they, their actual physical size. Otherwise, the, the sizes of galaxies are a little too small relative to their the distance between them to, to show what's going on. But you'll see that there are regions, again, where there's almost no galaxies in other regions with very tight clumps of galaxies, what we call clusters of galaxies, and uh, we get sense, some sense of the richness. So let me just let this play for a little while. You can get some, some, some sense. Yeah, it really is. It really is uh, awesome to watch. So this, this uh, again is data uh, from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that I mentioned. Uh, I sh should just um, mention it's a two and a half meter telescope uh, in southern New Mexico that has been in operation since um, 
since about the year 2000 is still still collecting data and has measured redshifts for something like three or four million galaxies uh, by this point. Maybe there goes a cluster of galaxies zipping, zipping by. It's uh, really, really sort of awesome to take a look at. Okay, I'm going to go on, um, but this this um, this picture is available on the web. Web it was done by folks at Adler Planetarium. Uh, I bet if you Google Adler Planetarium Sloan Digital Sky Survey, you'll find it pretty quickly. If you want to yeah, see it on your own. Okay, so let's ask this question: Where did where did this rich structure that we see in the galaxy distribution come from? And so we've been looking at maps of the distribution of galaxies, but we're to answer this question, we're going to have to look at a different kind of map. And um, to set a little bit of context, let's remind ourselves of two things. One is that the universe uh, is expanding. That was uh, Hubble's great discovery. Um, and if if it's expanding, the galaxies are moving away from each other. That means the galaxy that they were all closer together in the past, which implies that uh, that the universe was considerably denser in the past. And it turns out that it also means it was considerably hotter in the past. The other thing to say is that because uh, even though light travels at the speed of light, um, we're, we're, we're in astronomy, we're always looking into the past. We're seeing, if we're looking at a galaxy that's a billion light years away, we're seeing the light not as it is, the light of that galaxy not as it is today, but as it was a billion years ago. And so we can, we can ask historical questions of the universe ask what the universe was like in the past by direct observation, by asking the question, uh, what happened in the past? And so um, so we'll, we'll be exploring that in, in, in two different senses in, in just a bit. But let's go ahead and, and do that. So what we're gonna do now is talk about uh, the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB is the acronym here. So as I said, um, if you extrapolate what I was just saying, that an expanding universe means it was hotter and denser in the past, you go back early enough close to the time of the Big Bang and, um, and come to the conclusion that, that the early, early, very dense universe was very, very hot. And one of the tenets of modern physics is that hot, hot things give off light. A very familiar example is any incandescent light bulb. Basically what's happening is the electricity through the filament is heating up that filament and causing it to glow bright. And that's, that's what we see as, as light. Uh, the early universe was hot and therefore must have given off light. And, um, therefore, we can imagine that we could see the light that was given off by whatever there was in the er very early universe, uh, that um, that light should still be around. Uh, and this was predicted by several folks and dramatically confirmed, as you may know, here in New Jersey by um, um, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, uh, uh, shown here in the, in the picture with the telescope they're standing in front of. That telescope is in Homedale, New Jersey. Uh, at the old Bell Labs, about an hour drive from from, from Princeton, um, and indeed a discovery that uh, basically confirmed um, to, uh, the basic prediction of of the hot Big Bang, which is what we're talking about here, and won these two gentlemen the Nobel Prize. So, um, in the picture that we're going to uh, about to show, um, we're talking about what we can see when we look at the full sphere of the sky. You know, we're, we as astronomers are used to looking up at the sky and we talk about the celestial dome or the, um, the, the sky over our head. And of course, you know, you can see half, half of that, the dome is sort of half, half that sphere, the other uh, spheres under you, underneath your feet, you have to go uh, um, wait, wait until the earth gets, gets the other side of the sun to see, to see it. And also, uh, also good to go to the Southern hemisphere. So astronomers, um, like to make pictures of the entire sky. And, and what we often do is, is uh, turn that sphere into a flat plane. Uh, and this is this sort of uh, egg shape um, here shows a representation of that sort of in the projection that astronomers uh, typically like to, to use. Notice that Greenland is not larger than South America in this projection. And uh, that is a good thing. Um, this is more or less correct. And that's, that's the pictures that we're about to see. So, um, Let's think about what we expect to find. Um, the Big Bang, did. there was no center to the Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago, but as, our, as best we understand it, um, the Big Bang happened everywhere at once, which is to say that the cosmic microwave background, that leftover um, glowing from the hot Big Bang, should be coming to us from all directions. 
there's if the Big Bang happened over there, we'd see we'd see the light from the Big Bang over in that specific direction. But uh, if it happened everywhere, we should see the light coming from all the directions. And here is a picture of the full sky, again, that egg shape that I was just showing off before. Um, 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 and what, what you see is, is the most boring picture you've ever seen, solid orange, which is to say it's the intensity of the cosmic microwave background is exactly the same in every direction you look. It turns out you can actually measure its temperature uh, um, and describing in technical detail, what that means would take us a bit far afield, but because it, it was hot uh, in the early universe, but the universe has been expanding and that causes the temperature that we measure to drop and the temperature is just uh, 2.7 degrees above absolute zero, which you can see indicated uh, in the lower right. So, um, so this is this is a direct demonstration that the that this Big Bang idea is, is actually correct. Um, we, but but it is on one side it's pretty awesome to see this, and the other side you say, well, gee, it's sort of a flat orange. Um, is, isn't there more to say about that? Um, so let's 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 explore that. What it really says is the fact that it's so smooth it says that the early universe was pretty smooth uh, then. But as we were just seeing, the dis the the universe today is anything but smooth. We saw these this uh, these enormous walls of galaxies stretching over. Um, hundreds of millions of light years um, and uh, enormous uh, voids, uh, maybe 50, 50 million or 100 million light years across. So the prediction, as people thought about this, they, they thought, well, there's probably a bit more to the story. The early, early universe was probably not perfectly smooth. It was probably, there were probably some regions that were a little bit more dense and other regions that are a little less dense. And the more dense regions have a stronger gravitational pull. And they're going to draw material into them to make them denser, which is going to increase their gravity, which is going to pull in more material. And you can see it's going to be a, a runaway process. Um, Jim Peebles, who I'll say a few more words about in a moment, a uh, professor emeritus in the physics department at Princeton, sets, says this in a highly technical way, uh, using the full language of of modern science, he says this process is gravity sucks, um, which I always thought was a, gr a great way to, great way to phrase it. So what that what that really says is that that you know it's we probably have simply not cranked up the contrast in this image enough. If we cranked it up enough, we'd see the initial fluctuations in the in the density of the universe that gave rise to the rich structure that we see today. So. So in fact, what we really want to do is, is take these two maps, one map of the distribution of galaxies and the other map, which is the cosmic microwave background, and see if, if we can actually tell a consistent story between them. There, the universe has had 13.8 billion years between the two uh, for gravity to suck and to, to make the structure. And we, we really want to ask the question whether indeed that that's what's happened. So in fact, when you crank up the contrast, here's in the upper plot is the first the first uh, um, straight orange uh, egg that I showed before. The second picture is cranking up the contrast. Um, you do see a, an overall pattern here. It turns out, and this would take us in an interesting digression, that 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 the overall pattern that you see here is actually due. It's a it's a, actually a Doppler effect of its own. It's due to the fact that the earth, that the Earth uh, and the Sun are moving with respect to the universe as a whole, um, and there's a lot to be said for that. When you correct for that and look at what's left over, and the pictures, I, sh I should have put on a label here. The pictures are from something called the Cosmic Background Explorer, which flew uh, in, in 1990. Uh, what you see is that the, well, two things. First of all, you see this big red band across the middle. That big red band is uh, emission from our own Milky Way. This is plotted in such a way that the Milky Way appears straight across the middle. Um, so the Milky Way is sort of a confusion in this in this picture, but the real the real story is what's happening away from the Milky Way, and you're seeing fluctuations at, at one part in a hundred thousand, which is to say the the map is smooth to one part in a hundred thousand, which is very very close to zero, but not quite. And so one of the great challenges of astronomy is to ask the question: How can fluctuations at that incredibly small level have grown to the um, to the um, the full structure that we see today. And that's sort of what we're going to go to. Um, th again, this picture comes from the uh, Cosmic Background Explorer, a, uh, 
a satellite, a satellite that flew in, uh, in the early 1990s. Um, let me show you data from something called the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, which is a much more uh, precise version of the map that, that we've just shown, shown here. Um, this here, they were able to make measurements well enough to actually correct for the effect of the Milky Way, so you don't see that big red band across the middle. But again, here we're seeing in much more detail um, the um, uh, basically the projected structure of the cosmic microwave background on the sky. Um, and there's just a funny anecdote. Um, there's a story that I perhaps um, uh, uh, um, apocryphal that when Stephen Hawking first saw this picture, he looked at it and said, boy, that's very impressive, and then said, yep, I can see myself in this picture. And so the question is, can, how many of you can see Stephen Hawking in this, in this picture? You'll notice here the initials S and H, oh. <laughs> which, in, uh, which is, of course, your eye just pulling out patterns. Uh, that, 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 that is real structure. No one photoshopped that in, um, which, which um, I, again, I don't know if Stephen Hawking himself was the first to notice that, but uh, that's at least the way I heard the story. So, um, so, um, so what um, people do, and Jim Peebles, who I mentioned briefly previously, is, is, was one of the great leaders of this, is to take the equations of an expanding universe and of gravity and say, imagine that you have an initial structure of, of the universe at the level that we're seeing in the cosmic microwave background. And now let's apply the equations of of, of gravity and ask the question, give it 13.8 billion years, what is, um, can we form the, the kind of structure that we describe that in some great quantitative detail by our modern cosmological model. That is, we can understand those two pictures together in one story. And so let me just without, I won't have time to explain in detail what's going on here, but this is uh, from a paper that was re released last month. So this is, uh, as it were, hot off the presses. In fact, I think it's in press, it's not yet off the presses. Uh, it's been submitted for publication. Uh, measurements of, and again, I won't have time to explain in detail what's shown here, but what, it, cr crudely speaking, these are various measures of how strong the, the clumping of that image in an image like that one is as a function of well, the quantity on the excess is, is how far apart two points are, appear on the sky. And um, again, it takes a, a full story, but the, the points here are measurements from, in fact, a variety of different telescopes um, measuring the cosmic microwave background. Um, and there's, as you can see, four different uh, ways of measuring this again. Uh, the full story would take some time. The line through that is our modern cosmological model uh, of the expanding universe. And the, uh, it turns out that that model has only about six or seven knobs that you get to turn, six or seven free parameters, as they're called. And they include things like the expansion rate of the universe, which is directly related to how old it is, um, how much dark matter there is dark, and how much dark energy there is, how much ordinary matter there is, and one or two more, and that's about it. And that is enough uh, to give you a model that 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 matches the data uh, beautifully well. Michael, yeah, um, we had a short network blip there. We're, we're back now. Uh, okay. There was a question before when you were showing the uh, uh, the cube with all the galaxies uh, with all the uh, this one. That's the one. The yeah. The question was one part in one hundred thousand. How do you rule out sensor error? Sensor error. In the sense, sensor error meaning, well, so um, what's your, I'm not sh quite sure what sensor error means in this context. I can imagine it might mean that, uh, you know, the precision of these measurements, actually, let's go to this plot. Um, this, the quantity that it's, it's, these are in funny astronomer units. Actually, I can explain the units. Remember, I said that the cosmic microwave background uh, is at a level of uh, about uh, the temperature was about 2.7 Kelvin. If you look carefully, you notice that the y-axis of this plot is in units of micro Kelvin. That's, that's uh, one millionth of a Kelvin. Uh, and it turns out to be squared. I, again, 
is because you're comparing two different measurements and multiplying them together. But in, in any case, what um, that the difference between Kelvin and micro Kelvin is is roughly that factor of 100,000 that we're talking about. So you can basically read that off. And the quantity that's measured here is the is um, as you can see measured amazingly precisely. What you're measuring are the fluctuations around the average. So you're getting both positive and negative fluctuations around to the average of 2.728 Kelvin or whatever the the, the mean value is. Um, so I think what sensor error refers to is in some things you you can only measure a positive signal, but in this case you can measure both positive and negative and it's it, the signal is beautifully symmetric as it should be as it turns out according to th the theory between those two. So I think that ends up not being a concern. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, and again, you can see um, that, um, you can see how precisely this has been measured. This represents um, development of technology. The first measurement, as I said, uh, first measurement of these fluctuations was early, early, uh, I think it came out in 1992, as I remember. Um, and, you know, this is literally last month and we've, the data have gotten much, much better. The technology has, has advanced enormously. Okay, um, this, I, this is perhaps not the prettiest graphic. Um, I, I should have grabbed something else, but here's a measurement of very crudely speaking, this, the equivalent thing from galaxies. It's not as impressive, uh, I think, as, as the previous plot, but it turns out what, what we're seeing here is a highly processed version of a similar kind of measurement now done for the galaxies basically using the same model that we've talked about before. Uh, there's this, this is a confusing plot because I should have, again, perhaps chosen a, a, a cleaner uh, representation, but it was from a paper released last month, so I had to throw it in, um, which again says that same model that works for the cosmic microwave background, uh, where we're measuring you know, um, light from the universe 400,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, maps on beautifully well. Uh, with the distribution of galaxies. Um, so um, I, I want to just give a shout out here. I've already mentioned Jim Peebles. This is a picture of him, uh, uh, now Professor Emeritus at Princeton. He's just completed a book, uh, which is now available by Princeton University Press. There it is, Cosmology Cent Century. He really is one of the leaders of this field. He 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 has um, sort of been, been a, a giant in this field, and he's he's written this really masterful, masterful book, which I I, I myself just finished reading uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and um, it's it's parts of it are pretty technical, uh, but if you really want to see how we came to this this realization of um, of uh, our modern uh, understanding of cosmology, uh, this is this is uh, sort of a masterful account of that. So I give a give a shout out to him, and you may know that he won the, um, the Nobel Prize uh, just last year in physics uh, for, for a lifetime of accomplishment there. So, um, so um, I'm, I'm getting close to the end. I've prob I probably have gone, gone a little over time, but let me just finish with a, a, a few thoughts, which is that our modern cosmological model includes some rather strange ingredients. I've, I threw out the words dark matter and dark energy, uh, which in uh, represent 25% uh, and roughly 71% of the of the um, total energy density of the universe. Um, these components are absolutely required to make beautiful pictures like this, and in particular, the theory curve, the, the line that goes through all these points. I said that we just got to, we could actually determine um, the, the quantity of dark matter and dark energy by, by fitting data uh, like, like this. Um, so those ingredients are absolutely needed for a modern cosmological model. Um, but we don't know what either dark matter or dark energy are. Um, we know a lot of, we know pretty precisely how much there is and we can describe their properties mathematically so that we can make curves like this. But if you guys say, okay, so what is dark matter actually made of? What is dark energy actually uh, consist of? Those, we simply do not know those answers. So this is some of the biggest questions that we have. Right now, they, they're mathematical placeholders, as it were, for physical phenomena that we simply don't understand. So, um, so I wanna just say a few words. If I, I should ask, um, how, how much longer, can I go for another five minutes or should I? 
you can go for now. another half hour if you like. This is all okay. wonderfully interesting. <laughs> okay. I won't go on for half an hour. Okay. So exploring these kind of questions of what what is what is the dark what's this dark matter stuff? What's the dark energy? Um, one of the things that we're that we want to do is sort of take a little bit more advantage of the statement I had made before, which is that the distribution of galaxies, when, when we're looking at distant galaxies, we're looking at them not as they are today, but as they are in the past. And so we can ask, start asking questions like, well, the large scale structure of galaxies today, those beautiful clusters and walls and voids that we were looking at before, um, how did that evolve with time? We can actually ask that historical question. What did large scale structure look like in the past? Um, well, what is the distribution of dark, dark matter? And, and if we have a sufficiently powerful telescope, we, we want to look at distant galaxies because that those are the distant galaxies or the galaxies we're seeing as they were in the past. The only problem with distant galaxies is the further away they are, the fainter they are, which means you need a bigger telescope to, uh, to do that. So, so, um, so what we want to do is go build a really big telescope uh, to go explore these questions. So um, the Rubin Observatory is currently under construction. This is an artist's conception with, again, a photoshopped um, um, I think simulated sky background in the background. Yeah, that's not that's not real data. That's actually comes out of a computer simulation, I believe. Um, quite sophisticated computer simulation. Um, this is a uh, this telescope is under construction. We'll see a picture of the real thing in just a moment. Uh, in the Chilean Andes, Cerro uh, Pachon, um, and this telescope is designed to make what will be the most comprehensive map of the universe ever ever made. Uh, it's named after, uh, Ruben, you may recognize the name, Ruben Verasi, Ruben, um, uh, astronomer who um, is responsible for, for much of our modern uh, observational understanding of dark matter. She was uh, one of the first to study in detail the um, rotations of galaxies, which is, you know, historically um, how we first stumbled across this idea that uh, dark matter exists in, in the universe. Um, Michael, so there's an artist's conception. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. A couple of questions uh, on, first uh, one question is just a thought, if there is a multiverse, could gravity from one universe affect another as an explanation of dark matter energy? People have explored those notions. Certainly the, uh, I haven't, I didn't have time to talk about multiverse uh, in this context, our current the 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 current story in which multiverses the, the multiverse comes comes into play is to imagine that what we call our observable universe. I, I should back up just a little bit. Um, when I'm careful, um, and I usually am reasonably careful in my wording here, we talk about the I, I refer to the observable universe. That the universe is 13.8 billion years old, um, and we know that. That number is, we actually know that number quite precisely now. That is, it's uh, one of the parameters, it's directly related to um, the expansion rate of the universe. The faster the universe is expanding, the less time it has taken since the Big Bang, as it were. Um, um, so measuring the expansion rate of the universe gives us the, the time since the Big Bang. There's corrections to that simple statement by which require understanding the amount of dark matter and dark energy. But anyway, when you put that all together from the data that I've shown and other data, you can you um, get that number of 13.8 billion years. Um, so very crudely speaking, uh, anything more than 13.8 billion years, uh, I'm sorry, more than 13.8 billion light years away has simply not had enough time for the light to, to reach us. Um, that's very. That's an oversimplification. The universe is expanding, so light. Uh, it's not like the the galaxies 13.8 billion years, light years away, and then the light has been happily traveling across the universe throughout because the galaxy has been moving throughout, and and that affects the path of the the light and so on. So, um, so I, it is an oversimplification the way I word it. But the point here is that there's the the piece of the universe that there has been enough time for us to see is finite. And that's what we refer to as the observable universe. When people talk about the multiverse, they imagine that maybe that, that the full universe is actually enormously larger than the piece, than the, the mere 13.8 billion light years times of uh, a modest factor that we can see. And maybe elsewhere 
much beyond our horizon. That is, that's actually a technical term in this, the, the limits of, to what we can see. One can imagine that there might have been a, other, other uh, big bangs. And um, in those, the, at, one of the people have looked for, one could imagine that if one of those other big bangs happened close enough, it could actually affect uh, observations of our present day universe. You might see some funny effects, for example, in the map of the cosmic microwave background. People have looked for such things. And the quick answer is that they have not found them. So if there are other big bangs out there as part of the multiverse, they're probably uh, far enough away that they're not directly affecting us. Uh, they're really outside in, in any sense our observational. Universe. We have uh, three other questions. <clears throat> One of them is, uh, are there any experiments planned or underway that you are excited about uh, that may help us understand the physical nature of dark matter? Let me just mm -hmm. go read the other ones too. Uh, mm -hmm. One person made a comment about this observatory, LSST. Uh, yeah. Wonderful, a beautiful observatory that could be compromised by must 40,000 satellites. Oh, yeah, well, I can and, say some words about that. And yes. then Remind finally, me at the end and I can go back to that. Yeah, finally yes. another person asked, do you feel the newly orbiting Starlink satellites will really interfere with telescope observation or yeah. can the interference uh, can the interference be easily corrected? Yeah. There's a bunch um, of yeah, let, let me let okay. me answer that that last question um, sort of at the end. Um, let me come sure. back to the the uh, Starlink and and all that deep sigh you can hear from me. Um, yeah, we are worried. Uh, but but uh, to answer the question, learning about the physical nature of dark matter and dark energy. Well, what this this uh, the Rubin Observatory that I'm about to describe, uh, it, it will be one possible answer to that. Um, a, you know, one thing that people are trying to do is, um, is, is actually think of clever ways of trying to measure the dark matter directly. That is, if, if um, our Milky Way, uh, as Vera Rubin had, had uh, demonstrated if our Milky Way is sitting in a halo of dark matter, there should be dark matter streaming through our bodies uh, um, while we sit here. And uh, dark, dark matter is called dark because it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't interact with anything. Uh, but maybe, it, maybe it's not completely dark. Maybe, maybe, and indeed people develop specific models that suggest that if you build a s sensitive enough detector, uh, maybe you can actually um, measure the actually see the dark matter particles directly. That would be very cool. Definitely Nobel Prize winning discovery. The, and a whole variety of uh, people have developed ever more sensitive uh, detectors to try to do that. Um, and they what they do is build enormous, well, one such experiment builds, uh, takes uh, a ton of xenon, um, liquid xenon. Xenon is a noble gas, if you get it cold enough, it will eventually liquefy and it turns out xenon is just right that that if a dark matter every once in a great great while a dark matter particle may come along and tickle one of those xenon atoms and give you a, give you a signal that you could actually see uh, those experiments are getting ever more sensitive and have come up with nothing thus far which are making folks very uh, nervous <laughs> and somewhat concerned um, I this may be the kind of thing I sometimes when I talk when I um, describe this, I say, uh, we, we, let me just go back to uh, this, this slide, you know, which we using these words, dark matter and dark energy, whose quantities we understand, but whose physical nature we really do not. Um, I, I sometimes imagine that, you know, 25 or 30 years from now, uh, when some, when somebody is teaching, giving the equivalent of this lecture, they'll say something like, you know, back in the 2020s, we we're talking about dark matter and dark energy. Boy, were we wrong. The real story is, and then fill in the blank. I wish I knew how to fill in the blank, you know. And so there, maybe there's some fundamental misunderstanding that we have. Um, this model works amazingly well. And, you know, I showed one, one example of that, the beautiful, uh, what was called the power spectrum of, of this, this plot here. I just find I didn't have enough time to explain in detail what we were seeing, but I find it just completely... Um, breathtaking. And yet, um, so we have a mathematically very successful model um, that inv involves invoking um, concepts that we don't quite know what we're talking about. So we may really be along 
uh, on the wrong path. But let me let me let me just finish finish up by saying just a little bit more about the Rubin Observatory, and then I'll then I then I'll come back to answer that question about the Starlink satellites, which indeed is is quite quite worrisome. So um, this observatory is under construction. This is a picture taken uh, in uh, 2015 uh, at the site where the telescope. Uh, uh, construction has started. This was taken before the construction really got started. I, uh, that's my wife and me. Uh, um, this is a particularly. Oh, I really. Uh, we were really happy to go to be able to go there. It turns out that she and I met had met each other um, roughly 25 years before this picture was taken. This was close to our 25th anniversary. Indeed, we met each other at um, at the next mountain top over. There's an observatory called Cerro Tololo which this picture doesn't show, but it's just over on the right side, um, where uh, where we were both working on our PhD theses on, on different telescopes there. And, uh, so it was uh, coming full full circle to, to come there. So there we're standing on a cleared sp uh, spot at the top of this mountain in the Chilean Andes. Um, but this is what it looks like um, now. Um, where that where that picture was taken is about where that, that um, Pointing at the screen, you're not going to see that. Where roughly where the uh, the crane is is shown here. So all that has been built in the last last years. Very sadly, um, COVID-19 is hit Chile uh, uh, at least as badly as the U.S. And construction currently is halted. This picture uh, was taken a few months ago. You see that the dome is nearing completion. Uh, they were almost getting the last panels of the dome. Uh, in place, and as um, and really wanted to get that done before the Chilean winter started. You know, summer here in the northern hemisphere, uh, winter winter in the south, uh, and they didn't quite get there before. Uh, everyone was told, um, you know, uh, quarantine. Um, and so right now in in Chilean winter, everything got tarped up basically, and um, waiting for first. The pandemic to ease enough for people people to be able to uh, go back to construction and then uh, finish the dome. So we're getting there. Um, anyway, um, let me say just a little bit more. So um, we, we did have one other question please. Not about Starlinks. Uh, yes. Do you think the Webb telescope will give better resolution on the uh, locational map for galaxies in the universe? Is there something special at the IR end of the spectrum mm -hmm. that will give us distance. Yes. So um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is what you're talking about, is often call, called the successor to the Hubble, Hubble Telescope. And as the question implies, it's particularly sensitive to infrared uh, observations. It's really designed to do that. It is uh, a very interestingly different kind of telescope from what we're talking about. The um, the Rubin Observatory, uh, I should, it's called, we, we just went through a name change and I should get the terminology straight. It's the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. The telescope is the Charles Simoni Telescope because Mr. Simoni gave a large amount of money for it. And the survey that it's carrying out used to be called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, but now is called the Legacy Survey of Space and Time because we didn't want to confuse ourselves with the acronyms. So that that's the current uh, terminology. So the it's, it is a rather different kind of telescope. This telescope uh, is really designed uh, to have, uh, to be able to look at a very large swath of sky at once. It wants to do this mapping exercise that sort of is the theme of this talk. The James Webb Space Telescope is, is designed um, to look at a small part of sky at once. It is really designed to, for detailed studies of individual astronomical objects, and is not going to be able to carry out these sort of large-scale surveys of the of the spirit that I'm that I'm talking about. Uh, having said that, um, this one of the one of the questions that astronomers are grappling with. I I said oh I said almost in passing that we're getting a beautifully consistent picture between the clustering of gal the clustering and nature of galaxies that we see today, what we measure from the cosmic microwave background. There's one fly in, one fly in the ointment on that, in that sense, one real inconsistency that people are really starting to get quite nervous about. It turns out you can measure, basically do the exercise that Hubble did all those, all those decades ago, uh, Edwin Hubble, the, um, and then the Hubble Space Telescope then did the refined version, which is to measure 
directly measure the distances to galaxies and compare it with the um, the um, speed at which they uh, seem to be moving, the redshifts. And that gives you a measure of the expansion rate of the universe. You can similarly go, go th you, there's a, a more indirect way to, to get the expansion rate of the universe out from the measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And those, those two are in very good, but not perfect agreement. And that, that discrepancy, as people make ever more careful measurements, the discrepancy is getting larger with time, not smaller, which is to say the error bars, the uncertainties get smaller and smaller, and the discrepancy uh, stays, stays the same. It's now about four or five sigma, which is the, which is sort of statistical jargon for saying that the, the numbers are really becoming quite discrepant. Um, I think one of the things that the James Webb Space Telescope will do is 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 explore that question, and and we'll have a variety of ways of measuring di distances to individual galaxies, really at the one by one level instead of these grand maps. That may may actually give some insights and see whether this discrepancy is real or not. If it's not real, that is, there's some systematic error in the in the measurements, and everything is beautifully consistent that makes the story simple. If it is real, it says that there's some fundamental new ingredient to our cosmological model that we haven't yet figured out yet. And that that is sort of uh, where we're going now. So let me um, let me just say that the, so the Rubin Observatory with the delays from COVID-19, it's, uh, things are delayed, um, but it looks like we'll be able to start what will be a 10 year survey of the southern skies in 2023. It's going to gather astonishing quantities of data, um, about 50 petabytes of data. And it's worth mentioning that these data will be publicly available to the full US community, including the general public and amateur astronomers. And, and it's going to be going to be made. Um, there's a, a survey that I'm involved in now, which uh, you mentioned in my, in, when you introduced me, uh, with the Hyper Supreme Cam uh, on the Subaru telescope. And it's, 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 um, it's a similar size telescope to the Rubin Observatory, but uh, does not have quite, first of all, we don't have a full 10 years to, to, to carry out the survey. People want the telescope for other things. Uh, but also the camera is not nearly uh, as, uh, doesn't cover as large an area, so it can do the mapping far slower. But nevertheless, we're using it to sort of give a t taste of what, of, of what um, the Rubin Observatory was gonna see. So here's a picture of, this is a real data. Um, this is about um, a degree by a third of a degree of, of sky. So um, you may know the, the full moon is about half a degree in, in uh, diameter. So the, uh, the full moon here would be a circle about this big. Uh, and, and so this is data of comparable strength, comparable depth or sensitivity to what the Rubin Observatory will find. But just imagine multiplying this by 60,000 to get what the Rubin Observatory will uh, eventually give. Now, you look at a picture and you see same same story we had before, stars and galaxies, and you don't have a sense of distance, but let's just zoom in just a little bit on this picture. And uh, this is about, um, about 12 arc minutes on a side. And you can see it's really incredibly rich. Um, it, this is a much more sensitive telescope than that picture I showed near the beginning when we had the Whirlpool Nebula. And so we're seeing much, much fainter galaxies than were visible then. Let's zoom in a little bit further. And you can see everywhere you look, there are galaxies. All, all, the vast majority of what we're seeing here are galaxies. There's a few bright stars. That's a star here. That's a star here. Almost everything, that, that, that one is a star. Almost everything here is a galaxy. So the vast majority of the objects that we're seeing are billions of light years away, each, each, um, each, um, each one containing hundreds of billions of stars. So this is a tiny piece of this, and this is 1 60,000th of what the Legacy Survey of Space and Time uh, will generate. And, um, so I, I just love looking at these pictures, galaxies everywhere. They're really, they're really fantastic. So um, I think I'm not going to have time here. So I think I'm going to uh, finish there and um, take take further questions. Maybe I should start with um, this question about Starlink and so on. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, we're worried. <laughs> when you're looking, uh, I mean, the the first statement, well. 
as you know, the Starlink and now OneWeb and Amazon and a variety of others are talking about putting up constellations of satellites uh, in low Earth orbit, uh, whose purpose will be to um, supply um, wireless internet to the globe, which, and, and I don't know the detailed business model, but I'm sure someone is making a, a lot of money or will be making a, an astonishing quantity of money here. Um, the, certainly the, the goals of making uh, wireless high-speed high internet available to literally everybody on, on Earth is, are, is a noble one. Um, but um, satellites uh, are reflective and they reflect sunlight. And you all have seen uh, artificial satellites uh, going overhead. And when there's one or two in an evening, they're fun to look at. But uh, when um, Starlink is uh, there talking about putting up t tens of thousands of these objects, and um, they, um, they are already appearing in astronomical images. Um, and they go in formation and, and give long streaks across the sky. Uh, they're shining by reflected sunlight. Um, so the first thing you say is, well, uh, okay, it's really only a problem in the twilight hours. Uh, once the sun is sufficiently below the horizon, they're not as much a problem. Um, that helps a little bit. Um, on the other hand, they want to put them up high enough. The next thing you say is you can make them fainter if you make them, if you put them up uh, a little bit higher, uh, put them at a higher orbits. Um, uh, but the higher the orbit, the longer they can, they can capture uh, sunlight. So um, certainly the telescope that will the professional telescope, at least, that will be most affected by this constellation of satellites is indeed the um, like is indeed the Vera Rubin Observatory, and uh, we have been quite concerned about it. Um, people have asked, "Well, can't you sort of dodge those satellites?" In the end, I mean, we've actually gone through the detailed calculations, and the answer is uh, no. Um, um, there, when there's tens of thousands of them of them in the sky, basically, at least in the hours after twilight. Or, or before before morning twilight, um, you, you will always, no matter where you point, you'll always get some of them. Uh, and certainly in the summer months, uh, there's almost there there are no hours left that are going to be completely dark. Um, the um, there's been a lot of conversation between the Vera Rubin Observatory folks and um, the folks at Starlink. Um, one of the things that one can do is try to make the satellites less reflective, basically crudely speaking, paint them black uh, so they don't reflect as much light. Um, that is not a panacea, but it certainly goes in the right direction. Uh, and and the good news is that the Starlink folks have been listening and responding and exploring a variety of options and have even sent up some of their satellites with some initial experiments of trying to make them darker. Turns out from their perspective, it's not just a matter of splashing some black paint on. Uh, there's um, if, when you, if they're not reflecting the light, that means they're absorbing the light, which means the satellites themselves heat up and that causes all kinds of engineering headaches uh, on their front. Uh, so um, we can have a long conversation about, shouldn't this be something that the government uh, either at the US level or the world level should be, should be uh, regulating? Uh, and um, this really did catch people by surprise. The only regulations that do exist uh, are concerned about um, uh, radio emissions, which these satellites also will do because that's how they're going to get the broadband internet uh, back and forth. But so they've they satisfied all the requirements there, but but there are, exist no regulations whatsoever about um, about sort of their their visual appearance. So this is an ongoing story and, and certainly one that astronomers are really quite concerned about. Um, and you know, there's a broader conversation about you know the effect that it has on just humankind's view of of the night sky. Um, many of these are certainly uh, before they before they get into their um, their the highest points of their orbits. They they uh, they are naked eye objects, and seeing many of these streaking across the sky is sort of fundamentally changing what what uh, what people can see. So it's a it's a rather different kind of light pollution than than um, astronomers already are so so frustrated about. Okay, we have uh, two other questions and maybe we should end here. We've been on for okay. an hour and 16 minutes. Oh goodness, I'll, I'll <laughs> sorry, sorry, them, I, no, no, no. I tend it's, to go it's on. It's wonderfully <laughs> informative. It's, it's great when, uh, when we have these opportunities. 
going to flip the questions around. Uh, one of them <laughs> is uh, a comment, and they were and you just addressed it a little bit is perhaps Vanta black, but then the satellite may overheat. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, you've already yeah, addressed exactly, that. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. Yes, yeah. So I mean, there, there. Are, so there are clevernesses whose details I don't know. I'm, I know people who know the details and are told and have told me uh, that they're not allowed to share. <laughs> I mean, it's all proprietary information. You know, these these are for-profit companies, so they don't. They're not eager to share their yeah. their uh, their ideas there. And uh, let's see. Well, I'll just read this. Uh, uh, this one more question, then I'll give mm -hmm. you these two final questions. Is there a way, question number one, is there a way to pull the Star Lake satellites down if the project fails? And mm -hmm. the last question is, I think, a great question, um, rather random question from someone. Do you uh, use a telescope at home? I've, I've often wondered if folks who mm -hmm. have access to the largest and best telescopes feel, yeah. still find using amateur equipment satisfying. Uh -huh. Okay, so let me answer the first one. Um, I, the uh, satellites themselves do have do have some propul some propulsion. They can move themselves around. They're not just passively in orbit around the Earth. Uh, so yes, I believe they can be deorbited. I don't know the details. I mean, in general, deorbit deorbiting, which is meaning getting them back down to Earth. Um, the challenge is how to do so safely, not land on Princeton or or um, New York City or uh, any other populated area. So this, um, but I think one can control well enough so that you could uh, send them to the ocean uh, should you want to. Um, do I, um, do I, I actually do, I'm sort of embarrassed to say that um, I am a professional astronomer, I am not. Um, I've never been an amateur um, astronomer in the sense of owning my own telescope. Um, I love spending time outside and, and viewing the night sky and had a wonderful time with Neil Wise, my binoculars, um, showing, showing um, with my wife and, and, and kids. But, um, um, but no, I'm, a, I'm very, um, I'll, I'm always delighted and, and sort of one of the reasons, one of the many reasons it's really a disappointment I can't be uh, there with you to, uh, physically today is the, opportunity to to hear all of your stories as amateur astronomers and and take a look through your telescopes which is something i always do very much enjoy um it's not something that i have not something that i have done a great deal of some of my many of my uh amateur astronomy colleagues are all i'm sorry professional astronomy colleagues are also very avid amateur astronomers in the sense of having background backyard telescopes and and doing a variety of things and the the other thing that's worth mentioning is that the the line between amateur and professional, as uh, as the technology has improved, uh, that line has really become uh, quite a bit fuzzier. And the contributions of amateur astronomers to our field has just been exploding over these years. And um, the legacy survey of space and time, these data will be available to everybody, and all of you can get into those data and, you know, go discover supernovae with, with the best of us and, and uh, uh, those data will be available. Um, and then, you know, there'll be a real role. One of the things, to get this a longer answer than perhaps you wanted, uh, one of the things that the survey will do is repeatedly observe the sky, which gives you the opportunity to look for variable uh, and changing objects of all sorts. Uh, so the number of variable stars and ex explosions, uh, stellar, uh, celestial explosions of various sorts that the, the telescope will discover will be enormous. Uh, and there will be a huge uh, role for uh, the amateur community to follow this up because uh, you will suddenly decide that this particular object is is worthy and fascinating to, dis to, to study in the long, long term. The legacy survey of space and time will be able to do that at some level, but it's got the entire sky to map. So, um, you know, there'll be many, many opportunities uh, for for the amateur community to step in and and start uh, start following up uh, individual interesting objects that it finds. Okay, well, we certainly appreciate your time tonight. It was a wonderfully informative uh, presentation. And with that, we'll um, end our streaming this evening. So I, I I will applaud you. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. We'll have we'll have everybody at home applauding. Also, we we appreciate your. Uh, uh, being with us this evening.